let's write an operating system, or at least port an operating system that someone has already written, because writing our own sounds like work. So what I've got here is a copy of Alan Cox's Fusix operating system, which is a very small Unix-alike operating system for platforms like the Z80, the 8080, and so on. It provides most of a reasonable Unix-like operating environment with multiple processors, normal file system, binaries, etc., except it will run on tiny platforms. And also here, I have one of these, or at least a grey market clone of one of these. This is a ESP8266 uh, Wi-Fi module. They are absurdly cheap. I think I spent a little bit more for mine, which turned out not to be real, but seems to work anyway. They are based around a 32-bit microcontroller with 96k of data RAM, 64k of instruction RAM, and a decent chunk of flash. I don't actually know how much flash mine has. They're mostly intended to be used as turnkey Internet of Things devices where you write your program, uh, blow it onto the flash, and uh, run it from there. However, because it's got instruction RAM, which can be used to run code out of, we should be able to run a real operating system on it. And I'm going to give a decent try at porting Fusix to the ESP8266. Now this is actually going to be a series. I doubt very much whether I'm going to finish this in one chunk of work, and in fact I'm not intending to. So rather than the epic nine hour videos, I'm going to be producing some short videos working through porting this thing. It's a fairly large job, so we'll see how it goes. I have done this before. I've ported Fusix to both the Raspberry Pi and the MSP430, another tiny microcontroller. Uh, but various issues meant that it never got upstreamed. I'm hoping this one will actually get upstreamed. Now, I did do some pre-work where I got a basic Hello World running on the platform. So it's built. I can use this command line to burn it onto the device, which is connected via USB, connect up a TTY, and I'm in the wrong directory. Let's try that again. And it works. I need to hit the reset button to make it actually run. There we go. I don't know what the garbage is. It seems to be something produced by the device's boot ROM. It then takes a little bit of time for the UART to get into working order, so the hello fails, but uh, it does work. So we have, a, we have it actually running code. So from here, we're going to expand this into a complete kernel port. Okay, about the ESP8266. It's based around a extensor LX6 uh, processor, which is kind of weird. Uh, the extensor architecture is designed to be expanded by end users. So the CPU it's actually got is a thing called the LX106, for which there is practically no documentation. So what I've got here is the base documentation for the extensor instruction set, which should work. I shouldn't have to write actual machine code very much for this. A little bit, but not much. Uh, it's a 32-bit CPU with 26-bit uh, instructions, which is interesting. Uh, it's got 16 registers. There's a, there's a register window system that I believe the LX106 doesn't have. It's an optional extra. Uh, it's a little bit weird, but seems to work pretty well. Um, I can uh, use this disassembler. It's well covered by GCC and bin utils. Uh, I just installed this toolchain off Debian, which is nice. So this is the program here 
that I wrote to it. So let me find some actual code, not some data. Uh, not that the main. Here we go. Here is the main program, which is this. Uh, a1 is the stack pointer, so this is allocating stack frame. Uh, this stores A12 onto the stack frame. This loads a value via the uh, program counter relative addressing, and so on. There's nothing particularly exciting about it. Uh, you notice here are the 24-bit instructions. However, the LX106 has the option where some instructions can be represented in 16 bits for increased code density. Now, over here, I have a disassembly of the entire boot ROM, which is on the device. This is not the flash. This is mask ROM, which is part of the, uh, the module. I've got this because it provides a very useful reference for things like memory areas and I will need to know how some of the ROM works. You see, the thing about the ESP8266 is the ROM is always in control. There's quite a lot of code in it. it things like the interrupt vectors are always routed through the ROM. So we have to use the ROM's functionality to do things like register interrupts. It's actually got some pretty useful stuff in it, so we're going to use that as well. But uh, we have to have it. We can't simply load our operating system and then ignore it. Now, here is the memory map of the device. And just like the rest of the ESP8266, the memory map is kind of weird. Now, the useful bits for us are these blocks. This is the RAM. It's got 96K divided into two contiguous areas. The first area is not used at all by the system. The second area, this one, is used by the ROM for things like uh, interrupt vector tables, and it also has the default stack in it. The usage of this is not very well known. It's a whole 16K, so it's actually been rather nice to be able to use some of that. But uh, we'll see. Uh, I'm going to ignore it for the time being. Here is the 64K boot ROM. This is the thing that's in this file. And here is the 64K of instruction RAM. Instruction RAM is weird. It can be read and written using normal data operations, but only 32-bit ones. It doesn't support reading bytes or shorts at all. Its primary purpose is for actually executing code. And uh, the thing is that because this is RAM, then if you power it down, all your code gets lost, which is where this comes in. This is where the flash chip is mapped. Unfortunately, the flash chip is a SPI serial flash device, which means the CPU cannot actually run code from it. So what it's got instead is a rather odd system where it will essentially demand page code from the flash, which will show up to user code as being in this memory block. However, the code is actually executed from these two instruction RAM cache blocks. So what happens is that once it's set up, you uh, jump to an address here. The CPU will then intercept the load, the instruction load. It will look to see if that instruction is somewhere in the cache. If it's not, it will load a chunk from the uh, SBI flash into the cache and then execute it using some kind of hidden memory management system to make it look as if it's coming from here. This is pretty cunning as it allows you to have like a complete megabyte of flash code, which is just like code you can execute. Although I do notice that this number here is wrong. Uh, without actually having 
to either memory map a real NOR flash device, which are expensive, or to copy code into RAM. It's, it's done automatically here. So, because there's actually a reasonable chunk of complexity here, this means that we have to use the bootloader to load our code out of Flash, because when the system's turned on, none of this stuff is set up yet. So, the only code that can execute is here in the boot ROM. So, when you start up the system, what it will do is it will copy a chunk of data from the Flash uh, using normal SPI load and save routines, none of the memory map stuff, into this 32K block. And you then get 32K worth of code to play with in order to set up the rest of your system, which normally involves initializing this stuff. Once that's done, you can then use this block of instruction RAM for anything you like. So let's go back to this disassembly. Uh, our very small operating system image starts at this address, which of course corresponds to the instruction RAM, because this is code that the bootloader has copied into the instruction RAM. And after initialization, the bootloader will then jump to the entry point routine, which is here. Now this code actually belongs in boot.c, which is this. So what we do is we set the system clock. We're using the default value of 52 megahertz because that's easily fast enough. You can run these things up to 350, which is kind of impressive. Uh, and then we set up the UART to allow us to actually send text to the system. We then enable the SPI flash memory mapping stuff. Once this is done, we can then execute code from flash. Following from that, we have a simple loop that just initializes the BSS memory in the kernel to zeros. BSS memory is variables that look like that. C defines that these have to be initialized to zero, so this is the code that does it. If it looks like that, then this is actually initialized in a different way. Uh, what happens here is the compiler will generate a chunk of data that lives in the flash that the bootloader then copies into RAM. But that's done for us, I hope. We'll find out that later, so we shouldn't have to worry about it. And once that's done, we then call main, which lives at lives at the flash address. So here, oh, this is the BSS initialization stuff. Here is where we call main. So this loads the address of the main function, and this calls it. And then we have some unused code to terminate the subroutine. Now main itself lives here. 4021.0008, which if we go back to the memory map, is in the flash block. It's uh, 64k advanced from the beginning of the flash, because that 64k contains both the 32k of initial code and various fields like headers, addresses, where the entry point is, the data, the, init the initial data, etc, etc. So once we get to here, we should have a full running execution environment. Now I should add that most people who program the ESP8266 don't do this. This is bare metal programming. What they usually do is use one of these SDKs, which are provided by Espressif. Espressif? Espressif? The people who make the module. 
these contain huge libraries of useful routines, including things like Wi-Fi, TCP IP stack, timers, file system, etc., etc. But we're going to be using none of that. We're doing it all from scratch. All right, then. So where do we start? Well, the first thing is to go look at another port. This is the Atari ST port. And in here, we should find the initial piece of code that gets executed. Uh, it's in fact not there. OK, let's go look at a different one. Uh, this is the one I'm more familiar with. Sadly, this particular port uh, got a bit rotted and no longer works. Hmm. OK, I am familiar with the source code, but it has been a while. So, somewhere in here should be the routine that actually gets executed. I thought it was going to be in main.c, but apparently it's not. So this has got stuff to initialize. This is for the Atari ST, so it initializes things like the memory map, the memory management unit. OK. So let's just do this the old fashioned way. Right, CRT0.S. This is the initial piece of code that gets executed on system startup on the Atari ST. So we can actually see, ah, yes, I'd forgotten this. Uh, right, Fusix main is the kernel's main entry point, but it doesn't belong in the platform directory. It's part of the, uh, the general Fusix source code. Uh, that's one of these files, probably start.c. This stuff is all platform independent. Uh, I've already got the, here we go, physics main. I've already got the build system working. So we, this is all actually being built. It's just not linked into anything. So we don't have to worry about that. So what we're going to have to do first is call, uh, well, turn the interrupts off. In fact, we need to add some routines to turn interrupts on and off. Uh, normally, you do this stuff in um, machine code, but it's easier to do it in C. So let's do that. That gets built up here. We have not defined a DI. There's also a set of directories containing CPU specific stuff. And the EI and DI routines were in here the last time I saw them, but they're not now. OK, so that has actually changed since the last time I touched this. So let's look. So this has got some low-level stuff to do with process switching. I'm actually looking for, nope, not there. Let's try here. Right. This is ultra low level machine code routines. That's a division routine. Oh, this is all math stuff. Exception handler. Great. Okay. Uh, 
interesting. Well, this is kind of less than impressive. I'll show you how it used to work. This is the MSP431, which is bit rotted and hasn't been updated. So you used to provide uh, EI, DI, and IRQ restore functions, which turn interrupts on, turn them off, and return the old interrupt state, and restored the state. So let's actually look for IRQ restore. OK, that still exists. So IRQ restore. Right. That seems to be what it's called now. And there's a configuration option. Soft IRQ, that's a new one on me. What does this do? Okay, so it sounds like we don't want soft IRQ to be enabled. This is our Fusix configuration file. Let that. Okay, that's added the prototype, but we still need the definition of hard DI. Now, where does that live? Hard DI goes in, let's find a platform that actually is probably up to date. Uh, hmm. Or maybe it's in a low level. Yes, it is. OK. So we need to create a low-level routine, a low-level file. Oh, apparently, I already did. And we need to add our interrupt routines to this and then hook that up to the build system. So let's find this one, which I understand. But which doesn't use hard DI. <laughs> let's try this one, which I understand. OK. Let's just set these to be I think that's the right in the right instruction. Uh, return from interrupt. Yep. Uh, I the way ret works on the LX6 is it actually jumps to A0, which I believe is the link register. Uh, the dot N just means it's the small form. With luck, the assembler will take care of this for us. Uh, let me try and find a reason, a routine that actually uses a stack frame. Yeah, here we go. So RAND. Uh, First thing we do on entry, well, we, we load some constants into registers. We allocate a stack frame. We save the old link register, A0, onto the stack frame. At the end, what we do is we load 
a zero out of the stack frame, retract over the stack frame, and call ret. So that should work. I mean, you won't do anything, but it should work. And that should be uh, E. And uh, oh, I saved that. Why isn't my build thing triggered? Because I need to add capital S assembly files. Okay, that should be global. The gas assembler syntax is weirdly variable. Here is the make file for uh, our kernel. Let me uh, see how those worked. Uh, this does not refer to the low level routine, which makes me think that it belongs somewhere else. How about the make file here? Yeah. Okay, we should get that automatically. So the top level kernel make file seems to include the relevant file for us, but it does need to get added to the uh, the link list. So where does that happen? Let's try a different one. Let's try the Atari ST port again. Uh, oh, I bet it's... You see, this is changing A sources and A objects which are the variables for uh, object files and things. But this is actually assigning it, and so is our make file here. So one of them is going to win. Ah, yeah, I don't know how the Z80 pack one works, but this one is obviously just, we refer to the file in the link list and it does it. Yeah, I, I'm i not a fan of the Fusix build system, which is lots of nested make files. However, I did actually try at one point to fix it and it was a complete utter disaster which I still feel embarrassed about, so I'm not going to complain, just stick with it. So we want level lx 106 And that has not worked. Why has that not worked? Probably due to too many underscores. So some C compilers, some platforms rather, traditionally add an underscore into the front of symbols when they pass through the C compiler. Some don't. Right, and it appears that the LX106 is one of the ones that doesn't. So, 
I mean, now I actually need to figure out how to turn interrupts on and off and, uh, you know, do it. So, here we are in the boot ROM. Now, there are routines here for doing things like turning interrupts on and off. I'm wondering if we can actually get away with using them. We are going to need to use the uh, the boot ROMs interrupt vector table. So the way you do this is you load a value into a register and you use the WSR command to actually do stuff to uh, special registers. So let me just find... Uh, RSR is read special register and I don't know the difference between interrupt and internable. So let's just go and have a look at this. Int enable special register. There are no hyperlinks. So H two three one. Yeah. Be so nice if you could actually type in a page number and have it go there. Two three three. Right, int enable. That's a hyperlink. Right, this, yeah, this is an interrupt mask. Uh, the LX6 has support for multiple different interrupts in different priorities that can be turned on and off. Well, I know, therefore, that when turning interrupts off, we are going to want to read the int enable register into uh, a zero is the link register, a one is the stack pointer, so a two is a general purpose register. I'll have to go look up the ABI actually. Uh, I need to look up which register is okay. here we go. Right, where are our outgoing arguments? Return address and stack pointer. A2 and A2 A2 to A7 are the incoming arguments. So we are return values. Uh, R2 to R5. Okay, so A2 is the return value, which is correct. We want to uh, return the old interrupt state in A2. So here we then going to load 0 into A3. And write that uh, and set that as the current interrupt status and it even built. So restoring, uh, this passes in a interrupt status that we've had from here in A2. 
So all we need to do is do int enable a to ret. That will set the interrupt status to whatever it was in to whatever got to, it will set the interrupt state to whatever it was before the user called di. Now enabling the interrupts is going to be interesting because I think we need to know what the what value we need to write to set all the to enable all the interrupts. We could just write minus one, that would probably work. This is the boot ROM's routine to actually turn interrupts on. So we can see here it's setting the value in A5. A5 is anded with A6. This is storing A5. Don't know what RSIL does. Right, this is to do with register windows. Which I th think we are not supporting. I think we're not supporting. If we are supporting it, then that's going to make doing things like process switching tricky. But there's a lot of stuff in the boot ROM that's not used. All right. Uh, let's just set Let's see if that works. So that should enable everything. Here is where we are calling our DI routine. Yeah, we should be able to do it cleverer than that, but anyway. Uh, DI is... Oh, that's interesting. Oh, right. So what I'm seeing here is that all these routines are in the image, even though we're only calling one of them. Uh, this is because I actually need to do uh, I need to do this. Put them into separate sections. This then allows the linker to only include the sections that uh, are actually used. Uh, the align for is because all entry points must be for aligned on the LX106. So, yeah, I seem to have somehow told it to disassemble all the debug sections. Let's do that instead. That's not really what I expected, to be honest. Thing is, what we're seeing here is that the source code doesn't match the disassembly. That implies that this has not actually assembled anything. Oh, right, that's a dependency bug in my make file. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to have to do this. The make file didn't know that I wanted it to 
uh, relink the kernel because I didn't give it enough information. Okay, right, that's now working. Undefined reference to hard di, which should be defined in here. Okay. Right, now it's complaining about the things I did wrong in the machine code, of which there's quite a lot of it. Well, for a start, it's just tried to <laughs> compile that with CT, which is somewhat wrong. So it should have used cross CC to assemble it. Yeah, the way porting operating systems works is you spend ages on tiny minutia at the beginning, and then you start making huge steps forward as big chunks of stuff start working, and then you spend ages on tiny minutia at the end in order to try and fix the last few bugs. So. If it seems like I'm spending a lot of time just trying to turn interrupts on and off, you're right. So in the CPU directory, there should be some rules that allow uh, that tell it how to build things. I know what's happened. I know what's happened. It's a nested make files. This make file is trying to assemble the uh, this file, but I haven't told it how. So why isn't the kernel make file trying to do it? So what's it doing with a obj? So it goes to obj. It's only trying to assemble this because there is it hasn't assembled the file in the kernel make file. There should be a dot o file there. Okay, I have defined cross AS. So that should be right. We've got cross AC and cross SS, uh, cross CC and cross AS. This is the uh, C compiler for the LX106. We've got these set correctly. This is the full list of object files. Unfortunately, I don't think they're sorted. Oh well. C 
So when we when we build everything, it does not, in fact, uh, So what it should be doing is building all the top level stuff, all the generic kernel stuff. Then it should be executing the make file in here to actually link it all together. So have I done that right? So it is calling platform ESP six This looks so. This is saying that it needs to build the platform before it builds any of the objects files, which seems wrong. Okay, um, I think this is another case where things now work differently than they did last time. So you see here is the rule that builds the uh, the image and it is referring to files defined in a, at a higher level. So like that syscall proc, it's not defined anywhere in there. Uh, let's just try building that. to install the tool chain if I if it's in Debian it's not there are several 68k tool chains in Debian just not that one so what platforms can I try The 8080 needs the ACK, which I actually have installed. It needs a patched ACK, which I don't have installed. Uh, let's try the Sam Coupe. That uses SDCC, which I've got. It's now building up to a point, and then it fails. Could be that the Atari ST platform's a bit rotted. It does kind of tend to. Hmm. I did just update from. Uh, the master branch, so it should be up to date. This is another Z80 platform. SDCC is a painfully slow compiler. The Z80 is a pig to uh, compile for due to its extremely unorthogonal and rather weird. Hmm rather weird instruction set. But I'm a bit surprised, to be honest. Why? 
Well, this is another of my ports. It's been a while since I've touched this. Interesting. Is my SDCC out of date? You see, this is why I'm not a particular fan of the build system. It's just difficult to get that one. Also needs uh, UC Linux 68K. The MSX is a fairly high spec Z80 machine that was pretty popular, so there should be people using this. This one should be up to date. Also, the build system doesn't do parallel builds. So my 8-core computer is not at its best. Great. Okay, so... Something's not right. Let's see if we can just work around that by putting this in here. Okay. Right, that worked. What happened here is my make file built this. This allowed the uh, Okay, right, and now I slightly understand how this works. This make file gets executed twice. The first time is to build the object. The second time is to build the image. So, I do not like multi-pass make files. So if we do a clean Right. So the first, yeah, yeah. The first time through, it's trying to build everything in this list, but it doesn't know how to build this, so it defaults to the old CC rule. The second time through. All the object files have been built. So we don't need to add it to the dependency list. Except that if we don't add it to the dependency list, this rule will not get invoked at all because the make file doesn't know that it needs to. Okay, so we would find a variable for kernel objects which contains like so. Okay, objects. To clean build. Okay, that does seem to have worked. Let's take a look at the file again. And here we see 
that it has actually linked in, well, it has correctly assembled our uh, enable and disable routines, but has not actually done anything. It's, it's, it's not omitted the unused files. Okay. Uh, I think that's right. Clean build. Okay, I don't know what's going on there. There's a particular option you have to pass to the linker to tell it to uh, discard unused sections, but apparently I'm not getting it right. Anyway, this doesn't actually matter. Let's burn and run it and see what happens. So, okay. Calling DI has apparently, you know, done a thing. That's taken us a little bit further. So we were looking at this file. This calls init early, init hardware, and then Fusix main. Fusix main defined in the headers, it's not. Because it's normally called from the from machine code. Yeah, lots and lots of machine code. We could do this from machine code. But I'm not going to. We just prototype it there. And that now, it fails to link because, oh, we do, do not have prototypes for init early or init hardware. I, don't, I think we may not need an init early. No, we don't need an init early. That's a platform specific thing. Init hardware is also platform specific. Yeah, let's just omit that for the time being. So now this is failing to link because it doesn't know about Fusix main. Now we can solve that by just adding that to our list of files. Oh, and now that fails because it's actually trying to link a whole bunch of other stuff it doesn't know how to do. Right, let's start at the bottom. Where does I open live? Uh, file sys dot c. Where does k printf live? Devio. Where does K put char live? Right, that's actually uh, one of ours. Uh, 
Uh, that should live in dev TTY. So let's just take a look at one. We're actually going to need one of these. Now the thing is that the boot ROM provides routines for doing stuff like put char. So we're going to use that instead. Uh, or are we? So it's got ETS put C. This is a blocking routine that uh, writes one character to the serial port. Uh, there's also got get C, which is a blocking routine that reads one character from the serial port. However, We don't want our get C to be blocking because physics is a multitasking operating system. So what we want to do is to detect whether there's anything in the serial port and then either return it or return nothing. Uh, we've got UART RX1 char. See, I bet this is the blocking version. And this is the non-blocking version. And one, what I'm wondering is whether I should be using the ROM routine or just duplicating it in machine code. I'd rather use the ROM routine, to be honest. You can see here, this is loading uh, out of a system variable, which lives at that address which is somewhere in that mysterious uh, system RAM block. So uh, by changing UART to dev, you get to change where the system UART is in the ROM routines. Um, OK. So let's add a... Let's add a dev TTY. Add it to our list of files. Uh, actually, I right, will just steal the one from this other platform. There's actually quite a lot of this. Oh, right, that's because it's uh, that's a video terminal. Uh, I want the I want a pure serial one. So a video terminal is a uh, it displays text on a screen where we just want to chuck it at a serial port. So let's use the MSP four thirty one, which is simpler. Okay, you want to get rid of some of the MSP four thirty junk. Uh, where's our main dot C? So this is the ROM routine for putting a character. So all K put char is going to do is to call that. We could actually be cleverer. We could alias K put char to ETS put C so that every time uh, something calls kputchar, it gets linked to this instead, which would be a few instructions cheaper. Right, this is the this is the low level kernel put character routine. This is the blocking uh, well this is the real TTY routine. Now I look at this, this is blocking. 
but it's relying on the kernel preemption to preempt the process and page something else in. So we may actually be able to use ETS put jar for this. This returns whether the TTY is, whether there's a character waiting. We're just going to do that for now. Junk, 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 junk. Uh, this is the routine that's called when a interrupt happens, uh, which we're just going to ignore for the time being. Is there a there is a dev tty dot h okay uh, my routine has bit rotted since the last time I looked at it. All right, let's have a look at a different one. Uh, this, okay. This structure here defines the list of TTY devices and their buffers. So let's define a buffer. now a fast TTY carrier is yeah that's also a fast I bet this is too the difference between uint 8t and uint fast 8t is that uint 8t is defined to be 8 bits wide while uint fast 8t is a fast int that can store 8 bits or more i think Fast HT minor flags. Yeah, the uh, the MSP four thirty port is hideously broken at this point. I need to revisit it and from scratch. sensible, I would have done a global search and replace. Okay. Right, now these are routines for doing things like uh, division, well, modulus and division. And they're normally part of the compiler support library. However, we're in luck here because they're in the ROM. So, we can find out where they are. Uh, 
say u mod si3 equals, and the other one was div. It's probably here. Yep, e21c. Memset, likewise, memset. Except without the underscores. So, what's the difference between ETS, memset, and memset? So, this allocates a stack frame, saves the value, calls memset, and returns. That's just a complete waste. So, where is memset? Okay, panic. Where does panic live? It's a platform level routine. Is it? No, it's not. It's in process. device in it that is a platform routine and I think that goes in devices to see yeah this is where all the uh, the character and block devices are defined so we're just going to copy this yes Let's see. Uh, we will we will have an ID device currently disabled. We will not have a floppy disk device. We've got a TTY, we don't have a printer, we don't have memory. Okay, that should work. Block devs, not there. Yep, I need to uh, I think that is right. It does seem to be right. Okay. Device in it. Oh, it's not actually there. So where is it? Uh, that is in main. What does it do? Right, this is, this actually initializes all the block devices. Which we currently don't have any, so that does nothing. Page map in it is the same. This uh, this initializes the banking system. We will eventually be swapping to disk, but we don't have any for now. Platform copyright it displays a banner.
which is disabled because we just don't care. And we're going to have to clean because the build system doesn't do dependencies very well. Set CPU type. That sounds like a platform thing or not. That's a low level thing. So what does it do? This detects what kind of CPU it is. Uh, which we don't really care about. Yep. Okay, so. Copy is another uh, ROM routine at that address. Luckily, so many people are using the ROM routines that Espresso for probably not going to change them. They've migrated these days to the ESP32, which is a Similar kind of device, except it's dual core with two LX106 cores, three quarters of a megabyte of RAM, uh, vastly improved everything, and is uh, the default software stack is open source, which is nice. Undefined reference to cores. syscall proc.c uh, val adder user mem Hang on a second. So the reason why I'm just I'm not just adding everything is yeah. Uh, various config features require different source files. Yeah, so in fact, flat mem has got the one we want. Uh, that should have worked. Why is that not working? Fuzix was originally, well, Fuzix inherits from a very old Z80 Unix alike called Uzi. Uh, it then got adopted by Alan Cox and updated and generally made a thing back in 2014. It's re really intended for Z80 systems with banked memory. So it doesn't work quite as well as it should on flat memory systems like like this one. 
uh, you can't use the MMU to swap between processors. You have to like, physically copy data in and out of RAM. However, as there's only space for one process in memory at once, that's fine. Now, we're always going to have to hit disk to swap processors, but it does a pretty good job of keeping processors in memory for as long as possible, so it's actually surprisingly efficient and effective. Ah, I bet... I think I want VMMU Yeah, let's just go for flat, I think. That's better. Okay. Uh, where does K malloc live? What do you know? Malloc. Swap block. That's going to be a platform thing. No, it's not. Is it a dev thing? There's a lot more stuff in dev. No, that's not there either. Oh, no, it's a low-level thing. Hmm. I do notice that... Only the 68,000 has a swap blocks. While the NS32,000 does not. Interesting. So what does it do? Not quite sure. Uh, It's a big loop that Right, I am beginning to think that this is that flat is not the configuration I want. I think I need I think that what this is for is for systems with lots of memory and no MMU such as the Atari ST. And what this is about is it's moving process memory into the place where the process executes and then out again elsewhere. Uh, so we want a single tasking system of which the MSP430 is the only one I know of. So I think we just need to Turn this off and clean. Okay, yeah, I think so. And we also need to find some variables to tell it where things are going to be in memory. Okay. So this file is the kernel linker script. This defines how our kernel image is being made. And the bit we particularly care about is this chunk up here, which defines all the memory regions. No, it's not true anymore. So we have DRAM1 is the system memory area. DRAM0 is the ATK user memory area. So what I'm going to do is uh, split DRAM0 into uh, user memory which is going to start at the beginning and be 64k long and then DRAM0 seg can be 16k and yeah so uh, 
Oh, also, IRAM1 here is going to be... Uh, let's actually change this to user data. And this is going to become user code. Now this means that this is going to become user code seg. So we then need to define some symbols. like so. Uh, note that this gives us 64k of data and 32k of code. We are actually going to have to chop this down a little bit because we're going to need some code that lives there. Uh, 32k of code is not a lot but um, I'm hoping that we'll be able to get most programs in there and the fact that there's lots of data available should make the system useful. So we now need to define prog base is user base prog load is prog base. And we do need to declare that. What's that complaining about? Uh, line four. Tell me that colon's not required. Apparently that colon is required. Yeah, this sit the GNU linker syntax is very strange. Okay. All right, this is actually supposed to be called user base. Right. We now need page map three. Where does that live? Is that a platform thing? It's a platform thing. Um, so I think that, here we go, where all but one memory variable is. These bank routines are the various different banking strategies. I think bank fixed is the one we want. Let me just check the... I think that doesn't I think this that may I think bank fixed may post date my MSP 430 work let's try and find platforms that don't have uh, that don't do multitasking so let's look at the dragon. Uh, 
okay so let's just set this up we're not flat we're not multi Once we get uh, I think we're going to need to configure swap. I was hoping to I was hoping to put off touching swap until after we got the uh, the disk system working. Right, and that was actually already defined there, but we don't want that. Oh yeah, this this stuff, the swap configuration here in the config file actually defines where uh, where the program is swapped in, not where it's swapped to. So configuration. So swap base. So we're going to swap the entire 64k of user space area. And we're going to have 32 swap slots. Uh, the way this works is there's a partition on the disk, which in our case is going to be an SD card, with 30 of size 32 times 64k. And when you swap to a bank, it just uh, slams the whole lot out to that area. It's going to be more complicated for us because we also have to copy out the uh, the instruction space. We may have to do some modifications through the physics kernel to make this work. U data blocks. Okay, I don't know what this one is. This one is new on me. So the U data is the uh, is the structure that defines a process. It's got all the information in it about file descriptors. Uh, signal states, uh, save registers, everything. Uh, we need to store that along with the rest of the process. So I'm going to do this in the hope that it's less than 512 bytes and it occupies one block of disk. And I need to define a swap device. Whatever that does. Oh, swap size. Ah, this is the size of a swap block. In pages. So this is actually going to be 64 plus 32 because we have to include the instruction RAM as well. What 
is this simple file system with no user banking. This is what we have, this is what we actually want. All task switching occurs by swapping the existing process out to storage and reading it back in again. Config swap only. We actually we are going to have to link this, aren't we? We are probably going to have to write one of our own. Yeah, we are. But I am just going to... But I'm just going to crudely fill this stuff out with what might be the right numbers just so that we can get things working. Okay, swap read. I mean, the first stage is to actually get it executing some code. Uh, that's going to be swap.c. Swap map. Probably a platform thing. Platform thing. I'm just trying to remember. Uh, okay, this is the swap only system. So what does this do for swap map? Right. Swap map is, if I remember correctly, uh, it takes a page number and returns No, I don't know what that does. But we're going to put it in anyway and see what happens. And because dependencies don't work properly, we clean and rebuild. Right. Page map base. Oh, that's interesting. We're not flat anymore. What does this do? This has got to do with user paging, I believe. Okay. Uh, there are multiple different strategies of memory allocation supported. Flat.c, from these re restrictions, this looks like 
uh, binaries are loaded at a random place in memory and then they have to stay there until the process exits. Uh, you can't swap or fork because you can't move it around in memory because it's contained embedded pointers. Now we don't have one of these, we have a fixed system where processors always exist at a particular location. So what was that dragon doing? So I don't don't want flat, that's the wrong one. But it does look like the dragon does not have a page map base. Does it have, does it want simple? It does. Okay, so it's got to be somewhere. And it looks like sometimes it's a function and sometimes it's a pointer, which is a little bit weird. So, because it's not actually defined anywhere, I wonder if this is actually Simple C sixty one. Ah, oh, prog load has set it. That will be coming through here. Ah, uh, that's come through this. Okay, right, this is because we set 32-bit mode, which is this, because this is a 32-bit system, but that's not what it means. It means a 32-bit flat, mem flat memory map. Clean, build, let's actually put a J8 and see if it works. Uh, kinda. Right, struct udata. This is the, the big udata structure, which is defined in kernel.h, I believe. Here. So it can't find u code base because we haven't defined config 32 bit. So why is this referring to it? I don't think we should be trying to compile that file. Yeah, I think something's gone, something's wrong with the configuration here. See, syscall exec32 should only apply for 32-bit systems because it relies on these fields which only exist in 
if you have config 32-bit. So why is it being added to the R? Something is setting bits to 32. This is, in fact, the CPU um, This is this, not this, bits equals 32. That's causing it to pull in syscall exec32. Things where a 32-bit system which doesn't really have a proper 32-bit memory map. Okay, what does the MSP430 do for that? Does not define rules because that uses my other build, my other now obsolete and broken build system. So, So this is the routine that loads binaries. I think that we're going to have to write our own one of these due to the split data instruction memory issue. Now, where else is bits used? It seems not to be. So we could, if we set it to 16, you would get the other loader, the one that loads 16-bit binaries. Yeah, let's try that and see what happens. Clean and build. Okay, that's got somewhere else. Where is types.h? That's a CPU thing. Which we do actually have one. So that suggests that we're not setting up something. Kernel CPU LX106. Right. Uh, this line indicates that it, has, it is trying to compile the wrong thing. Let's do that again, but without the parallel build to get some better idea of what it's actually doing. That's just tried to compile kernel.h. Is that because I have a comment after there? Yeah, apparently it is. Okay. Do fork, where does do fork live? Syscall proc. No, that's where it's in, that's where it's referred to. Oh, 
Okay, this lives in tricks.s, which we don't have yet. Tricks.s contains the low-level machine code routines for doing various cunning things, including uh, forking. So, there's our dragon. So, global do fork section text do fork line four. What this does is uh, the, a user process has called fork. Uh, we need to copy the current process into, uh, we, we swap the current process out. The, this then becomes the old process, the parent. The current process becomes the child. We then update various things and return. There's actually not a lot to it but it is very subtle. So let's just put a ret in there to make it crash in the most obscure way possible when things actually happen, when we actually run the code. Uh, you put L. This is the routine that copies from kernel memory to user memory. Uh, should be in user mem, which is here. You put L. Uh, we only get it if we do config 32 bit. That's a, that is actually a bug in the kernel. You should be able to do config 32 bit and uh, get this stuff. We're going to have to define that. We're going to have to modify the other things. That's interesting. config 32 bit is defined so why and we are we have included user mem but you put l is not there Right, we also need to define this to get the C version of the routines. In fact, we could just turn all these into mem copies, to be honest. Still don't get, you get L. We're not flat. We don't have a virtual MMU. You get, you get C, you get W, you put blah, 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 blah. If def config 32 bit. Have I spelt some? Spelt this incorrectly. No.
So, is this conflicting with use and direct? Aha! <clears throat> so this is actually just calling memcopy. So it is behaving as if config 32 bit is not set. I can see that it has only defined get, get C, get W, and friends. And in fact, if I disassemble those, see what the code produces is, I can see references to memset. So it's done the, it's done user memc, but it hasn't done config 32-bit. Why? So if we put an error here, that error's out. If we put an error here, it does not. Config 32 bit is not set. This has included config.h. So config okay. I'm going to clean for that. Okay, so something undefining config 32 bit. No. I am very confused by this. Okay, so if not defined config bit error not defined that has not errored out
interesting. What does kernel 32 do? It's, yeah, there is something funny going on here. That errors. That does not. So somewhere in here, uh, I'm just trying to find where it's a, where it's compiling user mem. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, these two compiler configuration options. The first one tells the compiler to generate long jumps, this uh, long calls. This is where it loads the address into a register and then calls the register. You saw it earlier in the disassemblies. Uh, um, yeah, I can't show you that again until it compiles. Uh, the reason for that is the standard call routine has a fairly short range and we can't call the ROM from code without it. Uh, this one tells it to never use byte or word memory accessors. This allows us to put data in the flash. Uh, the flash is always, is always accessed via the instruction RAM, which doesn't support, doesn't support non-integer accessors. The, this increases code size by apparently 3%, so it's worth doing. Otherwise, you have to copy all your data into, da into data RAM, which is, which is pretty precious. But I'm still confused about what's going on here. I feel like this, is, this file is being... Uh, included multiple times
Also, I'm not very happy with these. But you put I. Hmm. So that would appear to be defined in kernel thirty two dot H. Yeah, I think that there's something. I mean, this is because we are setting a prog load here. So, but then why aren't we getting duplicates? Hang on a second. I have a feeling that different files are being compiled with different sets of flags. And that's why these odd things are happening. So there should be a config.h in each platform and nowhere else, which looks correct. So let's find user mem.c. So these, if you run that manually, we get a thing which doesn't have the stuff we want in it. So let's do that. And we do not get our warning. That has managed to pick up the wrong config.h. That wasn't helpful. I see the warning there. What what e, what minus e does here is it tells it to pre-process the result. So if I do that, I get the warnings. If I do that, I don't. Okay, well, CPU, platform, kernel include, This is strange. This is strange.
Okay, that errors. That errors. That does not error. So that's not loading that config file. So where is it loading it from? So somewhere in this ghastly mess, this is this is what the GCC program is actually doing. It's it, somewhere this will be listing the actual command lines. Uh, GCC runs multiple commands to do all the various things, which is preprocessor, compilation, and then assembly except that in an attempt to be faster some st stages are combined so for example this command line actually does the compilation in a single unit sorry it does the pr the preprocessing and the compilation together so I bet what's happening is that when we use a command line option to tell it not to do combined preprocessing and assembly, then odd things happen. So here is the machine code being generated by user mem. And it is referring to the right config file. Let's put that error back again and try that again. suddenly remember seeing this. This is a pre-compiled header. I have no idea where that came from. I should have looked at the timestamp to see whether it was new or not. Oh, well, too late now. Okay, so what is happening is when I use a command line flag on the compiler which forces it to actually pre-process things itself, everything works correctly. If I don't, it picks up this pre-compiled header that has been pre-compiled for an old version of the headers and is now stale. That is why very strange things have been happening. But now it's gone. Right, that's better. Now we get lots of errors, but they're errors I expect. Okay, uh, so let's take a look at user mem. Remember I said that this probably wasn't going to be done in one session? I think I was right. Okay, use mem direct and use mem c mutually exclusive. So let's get rid of that. Uh, this I keep forgetting to put the kernel on the front of that is problem solved.
this was copied from the MSP430, so the uh, CPU, the, these user memory access functions have changed signatures since then. Right. So what's happening here is uh, you get W, which is used here in the 68,000, has a, got a different signature from you get L. So we need to do that to adapt things. Or not. Oh. Better. So what's the reason for that is if I can find where that was uh, you get L uh, you get L takes the address to read and an address to put an error value in uh, while you get W and friends do not. I am not sure why. Ah, because you get W returns a you went 16. Well, I was going to say it returns an unsigned int 32, so we can tell the difference between a failure and a non-failure by the value here, but that's not right. Well, it's probably mysterious and could be due to bit rot. Good, we are actually progressing a little. Uh, page map base again. So, because Because this is defining page map base as a f function, actually a function. Hopefully that should sort that out. Okay, where are these uh, kernel dot h? Yeah, we can't use syscall xx16 because all the parameter types are wrong. We are actually going to have to define our own. Okay. Syscall xx. Uh, so we're going to change this to... We're going to change this to LX106. Right, so because this file has to live in the Uh, in the root. 
Okay. It's currently empty, so we're going to run into missing symbol routines, but root time lives in timer.c. New data, I'm going to skip for the time being. Sturlen. Is okay. That Sturlen needs is part of the compiler support library. Do we get that in the? Yep, we get that in the ROM, which is nice. is a platform thing. So let's take a look at the dragon. Does that live anywhere here? Yes. So what does it do? Nothing. That is what I like to see. Find reference to execve is part of uh, ah, I didn't want to do that. So I loaded that file in the wrong window. Never quite figured out how to switch back to the uh, the nerd tree pane here. So I just had to restart it. Uh, syscall exec. Okay. So we're going to copy this. And each. Here we define the system call, which is just going to, for the time being, panic. Okay, I think we're going to have to do uData now. So I think the, the U data is defined in assembly somewhere. I can't quite remember where. It can also move around depending on how you configure your system. So sometimes it's referred to, here we go, common mem.s. Sometimes it's referred to via a pointer in, uh, uh, in a register, a global register. The UData block contains both the process UData and also the kernel stack. The uh, the LX106 is a little bit 
profligate with its with its stack use so hopefully that will be enough so we're actually going to put this at the top of user memory are we we could put it at the bottom I don't think that adds any value no we are going to put it at the bottom because that means that uh, we can load and save a, we can swap in and out a complete process uh, while ignoring everything above the s break value uh, we start at the we start at the bottom and keep saving until we reach the top of the application's workspace if we put it at the top then we would need to uh, save two chunks so yes this is where we want to put it and that's going to be user base undefined reference to udata does that want to be eq instead? no Hmm. Uh, apparently that didn't do what I thought it did. I'm trying to define a symbol called this that is the same value as this. but it's not letting me it appears to be defining a local symbol but I have actually like told it that uh, it does want to be global suspect that they haven't updated the man page no. oh there it is uh, extensor there's not actually a lot of information there okay uh, See, that's to find a value. But that hasn't. So is... Do I need to tell it to import that symbol? Or I can... Just do this, which I don't like doing. See, now it's defining U data.
But when it's done like this, so I can see here, this is trying to import the user base symbol, but it's not exporting new data. Right, that's trying to import UData, because I've declared it extern. I do not understand what's going on there at all. It, it'll, it'll be a quirk in gas, possibly even a bug. Gas is pretty quirky. For example, whether it uses semicolon or hash to be a uh, comment character, or sometimes a backslash. Fantastic. OK. Undefined reference to execve. It's right here. Though, has it actually assembled it? Ah, we haven't added it to the make file. This is called LX, exec LX1060. Let's sort that into a sensible order. OK. Undefined reference to platform param. That's a platform thing. Which does nothing. actually have no memory at all of what Todd is. Oh, it's in KData. Right, lots of stuff's in KData. KData is the file that contains all the variables. And things like syscall, tables. Does it contain UData? No. Anyway, we are getting there. Uh, mem free and mem alloc are system calls that do out of process memory allocation and freeing. As you say, it says 32 bit system only, uh, which in this situation includes us, so we just do that. Right, act is a system call. That's in syscall fs2. The kernel is structured to allow the various system calls to be banked in and out. This allows uh, your kernel to be bigger than will actually fit in the address space for an 8-bit system. But we have lots of space available in our megabytes of flash, so we're just going to link everything in together. Uh, we want fs, 
we want other platform reboot sounds like a platform thing yes it is which we're going to put in here Eventually, we'll call the ROM routine to actually restart everything, restart the system. Platform monitor. I do not know what that does. Probably exits back to the system monitor if there is one. Yeah, it just does a reboot. Sync. Syncs the file systems. It uh, in file sys.c, which contains the bulk of the Unix file system stuff. It should be in. No, it's not in file system. What was I thinking? It's in inode. In fact, we already had file sys up the top. TTY post. Termios mask. Uh, that needs to live in our platform. This looks like it's something to do with uh, which IOC tools the device supports. So let's go with command TTY plus one equals. I have no idea what this is, I'm just copying it. Once things start executing, things will be clearer. Ah, that can't be const. That can't be const. That's not a pointer. Let's 
take a look at that MSX. Yeah, well, yeah, I am not really sure about some of this. either as you can't put this stuff in ROM it's all going to get copied into precious precious RAM I hope we're going to have enough okay well you put block MM this is memory manager stuff we are getting there slowly This belongs in low level. To do with CPU detection. Um, I I think we actually can't ignore this. I think we're going to have to set it to something. So a two comma zero. Uh, oh dear. Trying to remember how to write bytes. S eight I. Now the problem is that we can't actually write directly to an address. We have to load the address via L thirty two R. So that's going to be L thirty two R E three comma I hope that works. Three comma zero. So write the value A two to at the address A three plus zero. So we want two. Wait a minute, what am I doing? I think we can just do this to say we want one byte of common memory. Is that going to work? Apparently it will. Okay, sysinfo I think is also going to be a low level thing. Oh no, it's not. Uh, 
Uh, that looks like it's K-Data. Ah, uh, no, it's in version.c, which is generated at build time. So we just need to add that, version.o. Ram top is not sure what Ram top is. It'll be one of the many variables. Yeah, here we go. Yep, it'll be one of the many variables that tell the system where the top of memory is. Uh, and I think that we can just do that, maybe. No, it has to, has to actually be a value. So you actually round top equals prog top. Okay. Platform discard is a is a platform specific routine that is called after system initialization, which throws away uh, any code that is not needed at runtime. And in our case, uh, yeah, uh, so what this is doing is it's going through discarding all um, it's discarding the, uh, the stray code and it's turning them into buffers which are used for caching or everything really. Because our system is running out of flash, we don't need to do that. Platform switch out. is a tricks thing yes uh, this is the routine that does a task switch it saves uh, the state of the current process in the UData, which you can see happening here. It calls a routine to switch to another runnable task, which could be the same one, and it calls switch in to uh, make the new process live. There's actually not a lot to it. And likewise, we have switch in that does the reverse. This is all part of the task switching functionality. Actually, I don't need to put these stupid things in different sections because I know that I'm going to need them all. Apparently that does not align, and I thought it did. Better. Uh, platform switch out. Hang on a second. I'm getting switch out and platform switch out mixed up. 
So what does platform switch out do? Well, it's not there. Has this been renamed? I think it has, yes. So this is now platform switch out, but switch in does still seem to be switch in. Platform idle is the routine which is called when there's nothing to do. Typically, this uh, puts the CPU into a low power state where it waits for the next interrupt, which will be an I.O. event or a timer, at which point it wakes up again and does more stuff. So I don't actually know how power management works in this machine, but it is perfectly acceptable just to call red. I mean, your machine will spin madly and use up battery power and get hot, but it'll work. Program vectors. That does not sound familiar. Oh, yeah, I remember what this does. So this is intended for the Z80, and on the Z80, uh, all your interrupt uh, vectors live down at the bottom of memory, which is actually owned by the process. So every process has its own copy of the vectors, the interrupt handlers, in there. And what program vectors does is it ensures that they're written into uh, user space so that when you switch in the new process, the vectors will be present and you can turn interrupts on without bad things happening. But because all our vectors are in ROM, we don't use it. Need resched. That's another tricks thing. Is it? Ah, that's a single byte variable, which presumably is a flag to say whether uh, the current process needs to be swapped out. Yep. So that can live in here. Sysioctal dev sys. CPU. That's in low level. Right, that didn't do what I thought it did. Can we do that? Maybe. Page map in it, multiple definitions. Right, because we're using simple, we don't need the one in here. Whoa, we have an image. Okay, let's see how big it is first. sph 66 image elf. It's 37K of code, 320 bytes of data, 
about 10 cave BSS. That's quite a lot. Wonder where that's going. Uh, however, if you remember our memory map, uh, all this stuff fits has to fit in DRAM zero here, which is 16 K. So we're actually within our limit, which is nice. 37 K of code is not a lot. This machine's nice and dense. Let's have a look at that disassembly. Uh, all the code does seem to be showing up in the right sort of place. Let's take a look at our low level routine. I want to look at set CPU type and see what it's assembled into, uh, compiled into even. Okay, good. Uh, Movi is, is an instruction that loads a value into a register. And I was uncertain as to whether it supported loading 32 bit constants, but it has. It's done exactly the right thing, which is nice. Okay, well, I suppose the next thing is to try and burn it and see what happens. So that's written it to the flash, and when you run it, it instantly crashes. So if I hit the reset button, and then quickly pause it, I can see that it's died at... Uh, actually, there might have been some tracing showing up before the um, before it actually started to crash. So let's just It's getting quite late now, and my mind is going. So we burn it. And it reset and pause quickly. OK, we're not getting any tracing. It's an instantly dying somewhere in Fusix main. So something along here will have gone wrong. Uh, I'm actually going to disassemble the image to some disassembly. Oops. So that I can then load it into the editor. Uh, now, so 4021, that is a flash address. Uh, DF2F here, that is a ROM address. So what's at DF2F? We're inside memcomp. Interesting. Okay, so let's go look for 218E22. That's school to patch TTY default. Why aren't we seeing disassembly? This looks like data. Oh, 
I know what's happened? Ouch. Oh, this is really annoying. Okay. Remember I said that the... Uh, where did I put it? Here's our memory map. Remember I said that the instruction RAM and therefore the flash don't support non 32 bit accesses. And that I had to use that flag to the compiler to tell it to use 32 bit accesses for all memory access. Well, we're calling ROM routines for things like memcomp. And the ROM hasn't been built with those flags. Therefore, as soon as we try to use one of those routines on something in the flash, it'll do an unlined access and die. Not an unlined access, an unsupported access. It only supports 32-bit accesses. It doesn't support uh, anything else. So what that means is... Although I'm not quite sure why it's inside mumcump, because we're not calling that. What that means is that we can't use these. We're going to have to write our own. Which is a little annoying. Okay, we're going to do this the simple way. Add a simple library file. <clears throat> Let's see what the formal definition of memset is. Okay, mem copy. Returns pointed to the destination. Sterling. So I think that's right. Uh, this will read S and increment it. So it will always, when it reads the terminator, it will always increment S afterwards. So we need a minus one here to, to compensate. Right, let's try this again. Oh, 
Woohoo! We've actually got somewhere. Uh, let me just fix this. So that we can read the text. So we can see it start to boot. It these are all wrong. It's it's hung trying to enable interrupts. Um, I don't know where it's got to. Um, I'll have to put tracing through in order to figure that out. But I think that this is probably a good place to stop for this first session. We have successfully hacked the kernel into uh, running. It has a, it started. It's like obviously incredibly unfinished and lots of stuff is stubbed out, like nearly everything. But it is a good first step. The next session I will try and figure out uh, what is going on here? Probably, uh, it may be that that code to enable the interrupts we put in tricks.s. No, we didn't. We put it in low level. Is wrong. Uh, it could be that it has actually succeeded, but then something else is going wrong because these are dummied out. So these should probably be replaced with calls to panic. But let's do that next time. So I hope you enjoyed this video, the first of probably many, hopefully. And do let me know what you think in the comments.